Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Um, what I want to present here is, uh, is a project that John uh, Broadholt and I have been uh, working on in the last uh, year or so. Uh, John lost a bet, so he had to stay in London, so I'm getting to talk. Um, you've heard about this in the last three talks. Uh, there are uh, seemingly low velocity layers at the top and bottom of the outer core. Um, uh, some evidence first. Uh, this is a paper that's about an observation that's uh, about 20 years old, over 20 years old. Uh, Ed Garnero and his buddies uh, looked at uh, uh, what happens in detail at the core mount boundary and they saw a deviation in velocities uh, off from uh, radial models, uh, say uh, AK-135, PREM, or ISAP-91, uh, choose your pick. And uh, the, the, the amount, I mean, the, the, the magnitude of that drop in velocities as well as the thickness of that layer are things that are intimately linked. And this was uh, uh, picked, uh, picked up by Tanaka here in 2007 and they actually try to see how you can minimize the mismatch between observations and models uh, to uh, obtain uh, uh, a, uh, the misfit here, to obtain the best fit to the, to, the, to the observation through the models, and they saw that this would be the case for a, a layer uh, that's about 140 kilometers thick, and that is roughly 1% slower than the bulk average core, uh, which in this case was PREM. Um, you can see the same thing at the other extreme of the outer core at the bottom, and this is also takes us back uh, at least 20 years ago when Suryum Pupine saw in 1991, and I think they saw this only on the Western Hemisphere. I'm not sure anymore. Uh, they saw that they had a deviation off from prem. So what's plotted here is is delta v from prem uh, versus depth, and at the inner core boundary, once again, uh, right on top of the inner core boundary in the molten outer core, you have a layer that is about roughly 100 kilometers thick, and that has uh, a sharp uh, uh, decrease in velocity is about 1% slower than, uh, than PREM in this case. So how can we express this in terms of compositions? Um, that would be the first idea. You can try to express it thermally. You can try to say, well, you heard the exchange between Ed and Li Zhao. Maybe it doesn't even exist. Maybe it's what we don't know about the mantle. But if it's there, and if it's compositional, then we have to find a way to be able to say what sort of compositions would cause those layers to exist. Uh, so in order to do this, there are a couple of prerequisites. One of them is you need to know what the bulk outer core composition is because these are deviations from the core. So the least you can do is know what the core is about. You need to quantify the effect of compositions on velocities since you need to make lower velocity layers with a given composition. And what, what is underlying to everything that I'll be presenting here is that we will assume dynamical stability since the outer core is fully molten. You will always assume that the layer at the top has to be lighter than the surrounding outer core, otherwise it would sink. And the layer at the bottom will, be high, will need to be denser than the surrounding outer core, otherwise it will float. Okay? So how do we go about to do this? This, this was published earlier this year. Uh, uh, so, so when an experimentalist and a theoretician try to make a project together, they take a bet. So I lost the bet. We had to do calculations. Uh, those, those were produced by first, molecular, uh, first principles molecular dynamics. What we went ahead and calculated was the bulk sound velocity and specific mass or density of molten iron and molten iron uh, alloys, uh, with the alloys being light elements such as oxygen, silicon, sulfur, and carbon. And those calculations were performed at core mantle boundary pressures and temperatures here and similarly at inner core boundary pressures and temperatures here. Um, no, the real reason is that those experiments are really hard to do, whereas the computation is, is a little uh, less tricky. Um, so what you actually observe in all, of those, um, uh, in all of those graphs here is that regardless of whether you're at the inner core boundary or the outer core boundary, uh, increasing the light elements will make or increase the sound velocities and will decrease the density as you would expect. So by mixing those observations at the ICB and the CMB, and not taking into account layers, so right now we're just trying to constrain a bulk core composition, uh, you can try and estimate what compositions would be seismically viable. So you generate a series of, you know, what you think bulk core compositions could be, and you run them, you run them through the test of the calculations that you made, and you calculate the bulk sound speeds of the mixtures and their densities, and you try to see whether those fit what's observed at the CMB and the ICB, choose PREM or AK-135, any radial model will do. They, they actually are slightly different, especially at the bottom, because AK-135 has a little bit of the F layer in it. Uh, so, well, you have to assume a few things, right? It's a multivariate problem, so you have to assume a few things when you want to plot the data. So assume your core has, you know, no carbon or 2,000 ppm carbon, 
This is what geochemists like to put in the core. Uh, it can contain anywhere, anywhere from no sulfur to 2% sulfur. And then you calculate the solution spaces that match seismology in an oxygen silicon space, right? Those are the four light elements that we, we looked at. You heard earlier today uh, attempts to do similar calculations with hydrogen. So looking forward to what that will change in this global picture. But anyway, you have a series of solutions, uh, regardless of what you assume for, for the core and what, what the take home message here is that you can take any one of those models you want, it's not going to dramatically change the conclusion for the composition of those layers. So in, in the example that I will show later on, uh, we'll use this, this wedge here, this area, this orange area, because it corresponds to, you know, a little bit of carbon and a little bit of sulfur, which everybody likes, okay? So first of all, you know, let's look at the, the low velocity layer at the CMB and look what happens qualitatively, okay? Uh, you want to make a velocity that is slower. And to make something that is slower, when you have light elements in there, you invariably have to decrease the amount of light elements. So that's very easy. You, in, you decrease the amount of light elements. But what happens then is that you necessarily increase density. And there's just no way around this. And, you, if, you, and, and this is what I said about assuming dynamical stability. If, you, if, if the density increases, then your layer is going to sink. And this does not work. So one way around this problem is to swap light elements. And you notice here that this blue curve corresponding to silicon has a much stronger effect, you know, has a much higher slope than the curves corresponding to oxygen, car carbon, or sulfur. So that's one thing that you can try and do. You can reduce the amount of silicon, you know, to decrease the velocities. That will increase the density, but then you will increase the amount of oxygen or carbon or sulfur, but less so, and that will, again, re-increase re re the velocity. So you will balance the increase in density by decreasing silicon, while you're increasing oxygen, but the effect on velocity will be lesser, and the, 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 the final result is that you will have a layer that is lighter and slower, okay? So how about we quantify this? Um, as I said, we are going to assume a bulk outer core composition. This is just one example. You can take any other example you want. So that was my famous wedge here. You know, anything in there would satisfy bulk core seismology, PREM. 1% uh, sulfur, 2,000 ppm carbon, you know, about, let's assume that the core sits here. You could put it here or there for the sake of the example. Let's assume it sits here. And what we are going to calculate now is all the possible compositions that are lighter and slower. And they are actually there. And so depending on how much lighter you want that layer to be, say you want a, the layer to be 1% lighter than the, over, than the surrounding core, you know, the compositions will be sitting on that green uh, shaded area here. If you want that, la that layer to be 2% lighter, they will be sitting on that yellow area here. Take home message is very simple. You see that all those lines sit on one, on one end of that point, and they're all pointing towards more oxygen and less silicon. Uh, obviously in here, wh when you're on the top, the, the velocity contrast is going, be going to be really low, and as you start going to the bottom, the velocity contrast is going to be a little higher. But the only thing that you're accepting for composition sitting on those lines is that they are lighter by this amount and slower, okay? So now what about the inner core boundary, the F layer? Um, this is in principle easier. You want something that is slower and that is denser. That, we know how to do that. You just take one element, you remove it, and there you go. Uh, however, if you do this with oxygen, Say you assume that you, the two main uh, constituents in terms of light elements of your core are silicon and oxygen. If you do this with oxygen, uh, since it, is, it has a fairly uh, shallow effect on densities, you know, the slope here is fairly low. In order to decrease velocities by 1%, you are going to have to remove a lot of oxygen. And this is going to cause a very steep increase in density. And if you go to 7%, you know, your F layer, if you do this, to achieve 1% decrease in VP is going to be 7% denser than the overlying core. This is good for dynamical stability, but it poses a problem for the density jump at the inner core boundaries that this vanishes. And the reason why people started looking at oxygen in the first place was that this was the only element that would cause that inner, uh, that, that, that uh, ICB density jump. So, you know, it'd be a little uh, crazy to try to remove it that way. So another way, again, to look at this is to look at what happens in silicon. And again, silicon has a much stronger effect for a given uh, amount uh, on velocities. And if you want to decrease the amount of silicon in the F layer to get a 1% decrease in VP, that will translate into an F layer that's 3% denser. That is sort of uh, acceptable with an observation, okay? So how about we put this on a nice graph? This is for you, John. 
Uh, I know you like nice graphs. So uh, here, here's the outer core. Well, I still have an old version of, of Photoshop. So uh, this is the outer core here. And so we are assuming that there are slow velocity layers. Again, we don't have the observation, right? We're just assuming that those are there. If you tell us they're not there, well, we just go home and toss this. Uh, so let's assume that those slow layers exist. And we want to see what causes those slow layers. So uh, you first have to assume a bulk core composition, which you can take from this paper or from any other paper. It doesn't matter for, for the sake of that example. And see what deviation from that composition would cause those variations. And you will see that invariably, you have to enrich the topmost layer in oxygen and deplete it in silicon. And just at, at the very least, deplete in silicon uh, the bottom layer. Now, this is interesting here because if this layer is caused by interaction with the lower mantle, the only way you can enrich an oxygen deplete in silicon is to have something that's very rich in FeO. And that's something that John and Stefan and a lot of people actually like. Uh, so instead of reading through this, I will just focus on those three last points. And I'd rather take questions rather than uh, then read through this, but th th this is a strong uh, take home message. If those uh, low velocity layers exist, they seemingly are characterized by a higher oxygen to silicon uh, ratio, and they are consistent with the observation of the inner core and with exchange uh, at the core mantle boundary in an FEO rich uh, lower mantle. Thanks. Do we have some questions for James? trauma. George. Jimmy, you're, you're assuming that, uh, that each of the binaries, when you mix them together, right, you know, like FDS, uh, yeah. et cetera, It's ideal mixing, mixing, yes. Mix yeah. Together, yeah. Exactly. yeah. And my point is that you're not going to have ideal mixing in a metallic paper like this with different species. So what's going to be your conclusion when you account for the non-ideality of mixing? Well, we have to run the calculations first. But uh, no, I mean, that's, yeah, that's an, there, there are a few outstanding questions. The, the, the way you mix the binaries to obtain the actual composite sort of, of model, that, that could be an issue. Um, we compared, uh, that was, it's not in this paper. It's, it's in, in the published paper. Uh, we compared uh, a mixing of binaries with published data from Shockwave, from the Wang et al. Uh, Nature 2011. And they, within errors, and that's taking into account our errors, experimental, uh, computational, their errors, the experimental. Within the errors, we can reproduce what they find in the FeOSS, so iron, oxygen, uh, sulfur system. We compared with FeSI mixtures, and they seem to reproduce this. But that's a single component, so that's not saying much. Um, no, frankly, the only way that we can do this without carrying out more experiments on a more complex system with three or four light elements is by comparing it to whatever scarce data there is. And you know, to whatever we compare, it seems to work. That doesn't mean it has to work all the time. I agree. Let's thank James again. Thanks.